too many households in this country. I have often stood here and criticised the Conservative Government on its energy price hike, inflation, interest rates, the situation that faces our young people throughout the United Kingdom, where too many of them live with the fear that they will never be able to own the house of their own that they would like, or that the ever-increasing rent rates in this country, in my city in Edinburgh, it's outrageous, put too many options beyond their reach. And then there's the fact that the Chancellor didn't listen when the Liberal Democrats asked them to cut energy bills by £500 per household, which would have made a significant difference to so many families. Or the fact that the growth in the economy in the first three months of this year was only 0.1 per cent, that according to the ONS, after tackling, taking inflation into account, the average pay fell by 3 per cent, or that the take-home salary fell by more than £1,400. Madam Deputy Chairman, I was, Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg your pardon, I was delighted when I saw this, this motion because our economy in the United Kingdom is on its knees. And so are far too many families, and not just in Scotland. But my disappointment comes from the fact that the members in front of me do not seem to appreciate that they are in a unique position, a unique position of which I and I'm sure many other members are very jealous, that they are actually, as a party, in a position to do something about it in Scotland. And by that, I don't mean independence, which it turns out this debate is actually about after all. In Scotland, in a second, in Scotland, in Edinburgh West, I hear every week from my constituents, business people who managed to make it through the pandemic, who are struggling with energy costs and with the burden that the Scottish Government could alleviate, business taxes. But they choose not to, certainly. I thank the honourable member for giving way, and I wonder if she would associate herself with the comments made by the Scottish leader of the Liberal Democrats that Scotland is an ancient nation and should and would never exist again. Yeah, thank you very much. I thank the honourable lady for her petty and irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> by taking a comment made and taking it out of context, when we are speaking oh. about the lives and oh. livelihood oh, of people in this country who cannot afford to feed their children. We have to have a petty debate about a comment made in February which has been taken out of context. I thought the Honourable Lady's contributions were normally better than that. <laughs> to return to the issue at hand and the problems facing our constituents. Surely the cost yes, actually, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady has made me quite angry because this is far more important than that. Surely, surely the cost of living for so many people in Scotland, so many people of our, our constituents, could be alleviated if we did not now pay more tax than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. It is so bad that the Scottish no, thank you. It is so bad that Scottish newspapers today are reporting that the SNP Green government is concerned that the taxation burden, if it increases any, may now encourage people to move elsewhere. Is that not dreadful? Yes, certainly. I am very grateful to the, to the Honourable Lady. and I, I think when she speaks about the financial pressures and burdens that are on families and communities, she's actually she's, she's hitting the nail right on the head. Her Edinburgh West constituents, how um, important to them do she think it is when they don't have to worry about the cost of a prescription rather than find £9.65? Mm -hmm. They can be certain that their children, if they make their grades, will get to university without or fear of funding yeah. or any other benefit that they enjoy in Scotland Indeed. but not in England. Yep. How grateful yeah. are her constituents? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Actually, when my constituents come to me, what they complain about is not that they might um, have to pay that amount for prescriptions if it are not for the Scottish Government. What they complain about is the burden that they face every day at the moment. What businesses complain to me about is the Scottish Government. And what constituents regularly complain to me about is that they don't understand why this Scottish Government is not doing something about the state of our NHS, is not doing something to provide a better education for their children, to give them a better chance in life. That's what my constituents, in a moment. And as for Brexit, well, actually, I agree 
with the Scottish Yay. National Party. It is doing immense damage to our economy. It's making life incredibly difficult for businesses, and it's increasing the burden on families. But what surprises me about that is that it fails to recognise that to want to take Scotland out of the United Kingdom would be to repeat and to amplify that damage to Scotland's economy, to Scotland's income and to Scotland's households. So why is it that the Scottish National Party wants to inflict the same damage again? Of course, independence is their solution. It's the solution to everything. Not at the moment, thank you. And I have to say, I have to say that when the Honourable Member for Paisley and Renfrewshire South was talking about bad governments making bad decisions, I had to bow to her expertise as a member of the SNP, because when it comes to bad governments making bad decisions, they are in a class of their own at the moment. One only has to look at the mounting bill for the ferries, at the, the burden of business rates, as I've already mentioned, as, at the state of our NHS, at the state of our education. Will the Honourable Lady give way Yes, certainly. The Honourable Lady keeps referring to the NHS and education. You actually require public funding to support those. And much as it's very uh, common in here to talk about failing on health and failing on education, while all four health services are struggling after the pandemic, it is still the case that both A&E waiting times mm. and cancer waiting times in Scotland are significantly better than the other three. Yeah. And in yeah. closing the attainment gap, which does help young people have a better future, both at hires and positive destinations, that gap is closed by two thirds while the SNP have been in power. So this nonsense that somehow the Honourable Lady expects things, public services to be better, but with less taxation, is the same reality check needed as the benches opposite. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention because, like the, S the rest of the SNP, she does talk a very good game, but very often forgets that those of us on these benches live in Scotland, have constituency surgeries in Scotland, and we know the reality of the queues of people every week complaining about the public services in Scotland, which I know the SNP blame Westminster for. But they always overlook the fact that the Scottish Government has had record amounts of money. Now, I do not for one moment believe that the economic stewardship of the United Kingdom at the moment is the best stewardship it could have. It falls far short, as I have already mentioned. But I think it is rich coming from the SNP not to recognise the mistakes that they have made. I do not believe there is anyone in this House, in any party, who is not concerned about the cost of living uh, crisis, inflation or the energy prices that we are all facing at the moment. Where we differ is in our solution to it. Now, the Honourable Member for Paisley and Renfrewshire South offered us the I word, which I'm not surprised came up in this debate. I suspected it might be what it was about all along. She offered us that. Well, I would offer three alternative I words incompetence, inability, and ineffectiveness. All of them, I believe the voters in Scotland will take into account the next time they go to the ballot box in a general election. And they will apply them to both governments and their stewardship of their economic well being. And I think at that point we will see change, because the people of Scotland have had enough, and they want a government, two governments, who are competent, able and effective. Marion Fellows. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, the cost of living crisis affects disabled people far more than it does the general population. And I make no bones about repeating, not entirely, but parts of the speech I made this morning in Westminster Hall, because I think it bears rep repetition. I've had numerous brief uh, briefings 
from a variety of disabled organisations telling me that this government has continuously failed disabled people, yep. their yep. carers and their families, mm -hmm. that it's tinkering around the edges of a cost of living crisis which is affecting millions of people across the UK and that the impact of this crisis affects those with disabilities, their carers and their families even more seriously. Mm -hmm. This morning out on my iPad and the first story I read in the news was the story of a man stealing formula milk for mm -hmm. his baby mm -hmm. because his wife and he could no longer continue to dilute the formula they gave to their baby. I wish this was an isolated incident, Shocking. but as many here today will no doubt testify, this is not just a feckless couple who are doing it all wrong. This is real life in the UK today, and it's even worse for those disabled households. Yeah, yeah. Scope's recent disability price tag report showed the cost of being disabled in 2023 has risen to £975 per month for a disabled household. This figure is inclusive of disability benefits, such as PIP, which were designed to offset the additional costs associated with being disabled. This figure is £300 per month of an increase on 2016-17 figures, when the additional costs were £675. But Scope has recently warned that the figure could increase to £1,122 per month if the figure is updated to accommodate the inflationary costs for the period 2022-23. The bottom line is that this government's support for those with disabilities has been wholly inadequate throughout the cost of living crisis. In Disability Rights UK have said the cost of living payments that this government have given don't touch the size. Exactly so. Certainly. I'm grateful to you for giving way. We saw in both 2012 and 2016 the two welfare acts that really changed social security across the UK. Does she agree with me that one of the big failures was to do cumulative impact assessments? What has been the impact on a disabled woman who's a lone parent with three children, literally being hit by changes to disability benefit, the two-child cap, uh, two-child limit, the benefit cap, and the benefit freeze? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. She's absolutely right. This government does not take into account real lived experience and people with multiple differences, um, being a woman, being disabled, being a single parent. It just isn't good enough. Disabled people, Madam Deputy Speaker, often face higher costs for their gas and electricity. Many disabled people say they need more heating to stay warm, and I think most of us here could recognise that. And others say they have to use extra electricity to charge up items of assistive technology. My parliamentary assistant went to a drop-in session and came back to my office almost in tears when he spoke to the parent of a child who requires three separate machines to keep them alive overnight, and she could not afford to pay for the electric electricity costs for that. £150 extra, even including uh, the, the, the cap that the government has tried to put on electricity crisis, doesn't help. Disabled people have been suffering from years, and if you give someone a percentage on a very small amount, mm -hmm. it's still a very small increase. Yeah, yeah. And according to Professional Association for Social Work and Social Workers, uh, 7 million people, almost half of those living in poverty in the UK, are either disabled or live with someone with a di disability. Trussell Trust says that about half of the people using food banks are disabled. I sometimes wonder, and I know that this government does make some effort, and I congratulate the Disabilities Minister, who I spoke to this morning, but they do not get the bigger picture. So that when something like this cost of living crisis 
rears its ugly head, what it does is it ploughs the, the most vulnerable in our society into further debt mm -hmm. and into further difficulty. Mm -hmm. That I haven't even mentioned yet, and I'll very briefly say that anyone with a food allergy or anyone who requires special food mm -hmm. is in an even worse case yeah, yeah. during this cost of yeah, living, yeah. Mm -hmm. living crisis. Now, my party has consistently called on this government to uplift universal credit, yep. increase it to £25 a week and extend it to all means-tested legacy benefits. Those people who went through the COVID-19 pandemic and got no additional cost. This is just not right. We need to look at this. This government needs to do its job properly and actually help people. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, in Scotland, the Scottish Government is trying to make things better. Our adult disability payment, the child payment, which has recently been doubled and will hopefully be increased even more, all go to help families and disabled people much more than is happening in the rest of the UK. But there is a cost, as my honourable friend from Angus has already said, there is a cost to this. And that cost is, yes, folk like me pay more tax to pay for it. I have yet to meet a constituent who tells me I object to paying more tax to help folk less well off than myself. Yeah. And maybe just be that mother will and wish it's a <laughs> beacon of light. I don't think so. Motherwell and Wishaw constituent has built an old mining communities, oh. coal and steel communities, and they tend to know what it's like to be in poverty, but they also know that helping each other is the sign of a yeah, civilised yeah, society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, the latest uh, white paper from this government, uh, the Health and Disability White Paper, actually raises the spectre of putting more disabled people into the likelihood that they might face sanctions. Can we really believe this in the 21st century, that sure. we're going to sanction disabled people because they will have to move on to universal credit and then they won't get, not only will they not get what they're entitled to, any increases will be also barred under that punitive regime. This government also is very bad at signposting. Yep. Um, I'll take for an example of that pension credits, the uptake of which has been totally, totally disgraceful. Yep, yep. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm watching my time very carefully and I will just very briefly reflect on what the Prime Minister was doing today with the Farm to Fork Summit at number 10 where um, it seems to me a lamentable effort to try and mitigate the disaster that has been Brexit on our economy <coughs> and on the food supply chain. This government was warned, warned often during the Brexit debates, many of which I myself was able to attend. Yeah. It is not good enough. You we need, Scotland needs and wants to go back into the EU. Many people in Scotland still believe that that is the best way forward for this country. And we also want to follow the, the examples of countries like France, where they put blocks on prices to keep things cheaper for yeah, people yeah, during yeah, a yeah. cost of living crisis. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, this country is in a terrible state. Scotland is in a terrible state in terms of people who are suffering when the cost of living. I beg your pardon, sir. I didn't look up and see that you had <laughs> changed places with <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it's almost inconceivable that both the Lib Dems and the Labour Party 
are batting a hard Tory Brexit. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say how awful it has been for people right across the UK, what it's done in terms of food prices, what it's done. Oh. Um, I'm just about to finish, but I'm sorry, no. Um, that's my that time is up. Point, my time is, is actually up. actually incorrect. It, it, carry on, carry on, carry on, Mary. Uh, I'll leave it to the Honourable Lady to correct me later when she finds time. But can I just say that it is really important that this society, this government, reflects that a society is judged on how it treats its most vulnerable yeah. people. Yeah, 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 and yeah. on that measure, this government is failing. Yeah. 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 Powell Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I will attempt to be brief so that my colleagues here in the SNP can, can take part. Um, I, uh, before I get to, to my own remarks, I just want to note that this is uh, a motion, albeit derived from the SNP, this is a motion about the cost of living yeah, crisis yeah. before the UK Parliament. And I think the empty benches, with one honourable ex exception, and I'm looking forward to listening to, the empty benches will be noted in Wales and will be noted in England. They have no interest, they have only contempt. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the latest snapshots of poverty in Wales published by the Bevan Foundation found that more than one in eight Welsh households, either sometimes, often or always, do not have enough to afford the basics. The latest Round 3 Foundation figures show that 36% of children in my own Arvon constituency live in poverty. That rate hardly varies across the constituencies in Wales. Shameful. And even the generally better off Vale of Glamorgan constituency has the child poverty rate of 28%. We should be ashamed that people are being forced to make impossible choices between essentials and that they have no option but to turn to charities and food banks for the very basics of existence. Food price inflation, much higher than the general rate, is behind much of the suffering uh, that we have seen over the past couple of years. And we know, of course, as has already been said, that uh, this hits the poorest hardest. Yeah, yeah. That is one reason uh, why Pride supports this motion, and in particular the call for an unofficial investigation into the soaring supermarket prices yeah, and suspected yeah, yeah. profiteering. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in his wind up, can the Minister, uh, in reply, tell us what steps the UK Government are taking to make sure that as wholesale prices fall, the savings are immediately passed on to customers? There is a genuine concern that a failure to do so will mean that the current extortionate prices, and in some cases immoral levels of profiteering, I suspect, will become entrenched in the economy into the future. Energy bills remain sky high despite some government help, and that's in great contrast to neighbouring countries, mainly in the European Union. Many members will, like me, have received heartbreaking correspondence this last winter from people struggling uh, with cold and damp houses uh, because they can't afford to heat. Given that energy bills are expected to increase by 17% this year alone, and that households who have had to use up savings or take out debt in order to cope with high prices are now less financially resilient, I fear that this coming winter will be even more difficult. Exactly. But there is time between now and the winter for the UK Government to put support measures in place, and I will list four of them. Uh, firstly, a fair tax on share buybacks, including the £3.8 billion worth announced by Shell last month. That could be used to increase support provided under the Energy Price Guarantee. Secondly, the Energy Bill Support Scheme could be redesigned to target financially vulnerable households. Uh, another round of alternative fuel payments could be guaranteed, set at a level which better reflects the increase in the cost of alternative fuels experienced by off-grid households, something that has been neglected in the past. And particularly, Mr Deputy Speaker, the concern of mine that we need a fairer system of emergency help for poor people when the weather is particularly cold, for families, for children, for people yeah, yeah. with a disability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have a better system in Scotland 
though uh, it appears that this Parliament isn't interested. No. Mm -hmm. But too many of my constituents on upland areas miss out uh, by being on the wrong side of an ocean mm -hmm. weather line drawn up for uh, bureaucratic convenience. Now, looking beyond next winter, our system uh, must be redesigned so that energy is affordable to all. One option would be to introduce a social tariff yeah. that provides a safety net for, for vulnerable customers. One group of people for whom such a safety net would be particularly important is people with disabilities. The higher cost of specialist equipment, equipment, higher usage of everyday essentials and energy, and an inadequate welfare system are all making it harder for disabled households to meet the extra costs of that disability. On average, and accounting for inflation over the 22-23 period, figures by scope show that households with at least one disabled adult or child need an additional £1,122 a month to have the same standard of living as those without. Proposed UK Government reform as outlined in the Health and Disability White Paper that's making the situation worse by using the deeply flawed personal independence payment assessment process to determine eligibility for financial support for those not well enough to work. I call on the Government to rethink this matter. This is particularly concerning in Wales as we have the highest level of poverty and proportion of disabled people of any other nation in the UK. Now, since Scotland gained certain powers over disability benefits, they have been able to chart a different course by committing to reducing onerous assessments for people with disabilities, removing the private sector from the decision-making process, and moving towards a person-centred approach which truly listens to people's needs when they are disabled. It is high time uh, that Wales and England, for that matter, should have the same powers as Scotland so that we can all begin to restore the dignity and respect the claimants with disabilities deserve. Now, before I close, uh, I would like to touch upon support for small and medium businesses. Small and medium businesses are at the heart of the Welsh economy, employing 62.6 of Welsh workers. Ensuring that they are supported through the current crisis is therefore vital. Now, despite this, they received no additional support with their energy bills from the Chancellor during the spring budget. 24% of small businesses are trapped in fixed energy contracts, which were agreed when prices were at their highest. The Federation of Small Businesses estimate that this issue is affecting up to 17,500 small businesses in Wales. Many are concerned that this may force them to downsize, to restructure and even to close putting at risk the jobs and communities that they support. So, finally, I ask the Minister, will he commit the UK Government to taking real action and require that energy companies provide opportunities for businesses to renegotiate their contracts to reflect current rates? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Gavin Newlands. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, many of my constituents, like many across the country, are struggling struggling to pay their energy bills, struggling to put food on the table, struggling to keep their head above the financial floodwaters that threaten them and their families. Energy bills up 300 per cent or so in the last two years. Yep. Food prices up 17 per cent in the latest WITCH survey, with some of the, the cheapest and most essential foods soaring the most. Mortgages up by 61 per cent just this last year. This, of course, caused by the disastrous seven-week reign of the previous Prime Minister and her Chancellor. But the, the frequent excuses we have heard today again, uh, trotted out by the benches opposite for their inflation attack uh, on all of us, but hitting the lowest paid is Ukraine. Uh, the problem with that argument is that it shows just how short-sighted and backward-thinking UK energy and economic policy has been for decades. Yeah. Now, I am no uh, ge geopolitical expert, but it seems to me that by pegging your electricity prices to the wholesale cost of gas and leaving so many of our eggs in a basket controlled by Putin and murderous oligarchs that relying on a region that has never been renowned for stability it was nonsense on stilts. Instead of using past decades to invest in our energy sector, build a green industrial base and begin the process of decarbonising our grid and therefore reducing our dependence on the likes of Putin, 
Uh, the Labour governments of the past pushed their weight behind the, the dash for gas, while the Tories paid lip service to the very idea of industrial strategy. But it is their economic strategy, exemplified by the previous Prime Minister and those catastrophic seven weeks, that has caused mortgage rates to skyrocket, that has left our economy in the mire uh, and wrecked uh, wrecking any ability to recover from the kind of shocks to the system we have seen over recent years, whether from COVID or from Putin's warmongering. And most of all, it is a kamikaze Brexit unleashed in our society that has destroyed what was left of the yep. UK's capacity to invest in its own recovery and its own future. Mr Deputy Speaker, in 2016, my constituency voted uh, two to one to remain in the EU. Uh, my constituents knew and know that our economic uh, prosperity and our wider society are inextricably linked to our European allies. From the airport, which delivers the largest cargo exports by value in Scotland, to the whisky bonds and warehouses, which slake the thirsts of millions of Europeans, through to the universities and colleges with links to their contemporaries on the continent, and the hauliers based in my constituency, who experience firsthand every day the Kafkaesque world created by the current government. They have all been hit hard by Brexit, and so have their staff. They and we have lost a huge amount since Brexit. But then, so has the Labour Party. Many of us can remember the, the savage criticism the member for Islington North received from his own benches, because he, in their view, was a secret Brexiteer. Now, everyone in the new model Labour Party is a Brexiteer, including the current branch office manager uh, elected after the previous democratically elected leader was booted from office by the big boss here. Uh, it is no surprise that they are getting very excited about their small increase in the opinion polls in Scotland, because let's face it, what else do they really have to get excited about, Mr Deputy Speaker? Their boss down here has declared he doesn't care. He doesn't care if he sounds like a Conservative. Well, the Shadow Foreign Secretary tells his radio listeners the Labour Party can't be picking through all the Conservative legislation and repealing it uh, if it ever got back into office. Uh, he promised the abolition of tuition fees for higher education, abandoned in England but maintained by a Scottish Government trying to ensure that education and learning is not the, uh, the preserve of a wealthy elite. The Leader of the Opposition promised common ownership of the mail. Uh, energy and water, abandoned England but maintained in Scotland where it has jurisdiction, with mm -hmm. water bills in Scotland being substantially lower and 35 per cent more per capita invested in infrastructure. And he also resigned from the Labour front bench after what he said was a catastrophic result in the Brexit referendum, but he is now happy for the UK to wallow in that cat uh, catastrophe. Uh, well, a Scottish Government plans for a future within Europe and alongside our friends and allies. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, the truth is the sad truth is that you couldn't put a fag paper between the two front benches yeah, in this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are both setting policies that will exacerbate and extend the cost of living crisis, yeah. both hell bent on ignoring reality and ploughing on with the exclusion from the single market, both sticking their head in the sand as to the damage that ultra free market economic policies are, are costing and will continue to cost ordinary households across these aisles, regardless of who sits on the Treasury benches. Yeah, yeah. I wish the recently selected Labour candidate in Paisley and Rimshire North all the best at the next election, because she will need it going round the doors with a Tory manifesto, coloured in red, and a leader who would sell his granny yeah. for a few hundred votes in the Midlands yeah. margin. Yeah. And in that, I will give way. Yeah. The uh, hon. Gentleman for giving way. Does he agree with his colleague from Glasgow South, who said that Labour are just the same as the Tories is not a strategy, it is the absence of a strategy, and telling people Labour and Conservatives are the same will not get us very far. Do you, do you agree with your colleague? I'm very, I'm very grateful to the honourable gentleman for his, his intervention. I know, who, who said it was a strategy? It's a fact. I'm point, yeah, yeah, yeah. All I'm doing is pointing out facts. If he wants me to read out the, his, lead, his leader's speeches of, of going back on his word in terms of nationalising various industries, I'm more than happy to do that. But I'm not sure we've got time for it. But everyone here and everyone in Scotland knows that his manifesto will be Tory light in the next election. And it might work in Edinburgh South, but it's not going to work in many places across the, the central belt of Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does Honourable see the delicious irony that the electoral fortunes of Scottish Labour are hinged entirely on the electoral ambitions of Middle England? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's as if he's read my speech, and I'm sitting beside him, so maybe he did read my speech, because I've made the, making the, the very same point. Indeed, I just made the same point about Midlands Marginal. It, he's, the Labour leader is betting the entire future um, of the UK in winning a few votes in the English mar marginals. Um, and Scottish Labour uh, better wake up to reality. That's not going to cut it when they're out campaigning the doors in the next election. Um, at the same time, 
At the same time, the Labour candidate in Paisley and North will be campaigning against a Scottish Government that has rolled out 1,140 hours a year of free high quality childcare, delivered over a quarter million baby boxes to new parents, scrapped prescription charges, extended free bus travel to under 22s, maintained free eye tests, free school meals for pupils in primary one to five, all measures that are putting money back in the pockets of the people where it is need, needed most, and a rejection an utter rejection of the fallacy that the state should be rolled back, a fantasy that has afflicted the UK for the last 13 years. For the Labour Party to turn their backs on reversing the lunacy of the previous 13 years is a complete abdication of responsibility, responsibility that should be focused on those who need the state's help the most. For just one example, the First Steps Nutrition Trust report this month on the impact of the cost of living crisis on child diets found that infant formulas had increased by an average of 24%, while well, the cheapest formula went up by 45%. The average tin of formula now costs just over £14. While well, the Healthy Start grant in England, Wales and Northern Ireland was frozen this year, uh, and less than two-thirds of eligible families are successful in applying for the grant. But at the same time, the Scottish Government has uprated our Best Start package by over 10% this year, and has hit an 88% 80, an uptake rate, as well as rolling out and expanding the Scottish Child Payment, getting to support households who desperately need it. It is shameful, utterly shameful, that we have babies in this country with parents who cannot afford to feed them even the basics. Infants are crying with hunger because the pittance the UK Government has decided is enough to feed them does not cut it in the real world. And once those infants get older, Mr Deputy Speaker, the chances of them getting a healthy diet have decreased, with fresh food inflation sitting at 17 per cent. This is where the shops ha- this is for shops of fruit and veg at all. There will be those opposite with the goal to tell us empty fridge shelves and rocketing prices of imported produce are nothing to do with Brexit, and all someone else's fault. The hauliers, the farmers, the shops, the workers, the parents, the children, anything to avoid responsibility of the catastrophic mess they have created. They wanted to take back control. Instead, they have taken us back to the 1970s, with inflation through the roof, industrial action across the economy, living standards falling continually, and food shortages in our shops. Just this week, the Zoomers and Zealots who pushed their Brexit campaign in the first place are gathered for a festival of delusion up the road from this place. The influence, the influence that these cranks and charlatans have had on the body politic and the direction of these aisles is surely the most revealing piece of evidence that the UK is a busted flush. They have succeeded in isolating us from our allies and in continuing the harmful economic policies their great leader Thatcher imposed in the past. Those who promised that Brexit would mean taking back control should explain exactly what control they think they have taken back. Is it control over an energy market that is rigged against consumers and for the profits and that profits the middlemen? Is it control over the tens of thousands of skilled workers who have fled this country in recent years to their former homes in the EU countries? So disturbed, so dispirited were they by the hostile environment and bureaucratic yeah, nonsense yeah, yeah. cooked up by yeah, the benches opposite, uh-huh. with the connivance now, the connivance of the Labour benches too. Uh, leaving our health service without skilled and dedicated staff when we need it most, and virtually every bus company in the country cancelling services because so many drivers have moved to Poland. Is it control over an economy that even the government's own office for budget responsibility says will end up 4 per cent smaller than it would have been without Brexit, we have from productivity which will never come back while the UK sits in unsplendid isolation? This is a, an economic crisis which is not going to go away. It is permanently embedded in the fundamental structure of how the UK operates uh, and the way in which the UK governing class and both parties have turned their back on the rest of Europe. And what is equally shameful is that we have a Labour Party that has fully signed up to that Brexit agenda and signed up to policies which will continue to take us down that failed road. Uh, at least Scotland has a way out. At least Scotland has a government that is taking action despite the fiscal restrictions imposed by the UK to tackle child poverty through the Scottish Child Payment and Best Start, to create a social security system that puts dignity and respect at its heart, to invest in decarbonisation and a just transition to net zero. And at least Scotland has a party that takes its responsibility to its citizens to do better seriously. And at least Scotland has a government that wants to rejoin the world and be part of the mainstream of Europe rather than sit in self-imposed exile. And Mr Deputy Speaker, at least Scotland has a government that wants us to fully harness the wealth and resources of our country, natural and human, as an independent sovereign nation. It is time those on both sides of the front benches get out of the way of that democratic mandate and allow the people of Scotland the chance to escape a union that is costing them more than ever. Claudia Webb. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the cost of living crisis is not really a cost of living crisis. In reality, it's a cost of greed crisis. It's greedflation driven by a lack of political interest in protecting ordinary people. And of course, as with any crisis, it's the most vulnerable in our society who suffer most. And there are few more vulnerable and more unsupported in our society than those with a disability. Disabled people are, of course, no strangers to poverty and crisis. Under 13 years of Tory government, they have faced constant cuts and conscious cruelty at every turn, sharpened by punitive and pointless assessment regimes, conditionality and sanctions. We live under a, go uh, under a government that responded to the UK's mass crisis of debt and hunger by suggesting, suggesting people should work more, should work more hours or take a second job to help, their fi help with their finances. But many disabled people face huge challenges to work a single job, let alone a second, and are even harder hit by soaring costs of energy, fuel and other essentials. As the Honourable Member for Motherwell and Reshaw has highlighted, according to research by disability charity Scope, disabled households in the poorest fifth percentile spend twice as much of their household budget on energy bills, are twice as likely to have a cold house and are three times more likely to be unable to afford food. The heat or eat scandal is a mark of disgrace on this country, not least because people can afford to do either, but disabled people suffer the worst of it and it shames us as a nation. Again and again, for well over a decade now, the heaviest burden is placed on the shoulders of those least able to pay, while, while the wealth of the rich piles up. And in a constituency like mine in Leicester East, where we suffer some of the worst health and lowest incomes in the country, the evils of our unequal system hit especially hard. In my constituency, far more children, 37% compared to 26% nationally, live in a family with at least one disabled member than those with none, piling yet more hunger, ill health, stigma and misery on children in a country that is already failing them. The median annual wage for workers in Leicester East is £19,960, compared to an average of 25837 in the East Midlands and an average of 27756 in the rest of the UK. The level of poverty in my constituency is stark. My community is hurting. The level of suffering is deep. I am witnessing this daily. It's painful. Yet the Conservatives continue to offer, at best, a sticking plaster for the grievous wounds they inflict on the poor and vulnerable. In 2017, the United Nations has condemned the UK's government treatment of disabled people as a human catastrophe. And it has only grown worse since then. This abuse and abandonment abandonment of our disabled people is an international disgrace. It's a stain on the UK standing amongst nations. Until this cruelty toward disabled people and all our millions of poor and vulnerable citizens is reversed, the UK cannot consider itself a civilised nation. And every day's delay is putting it in putting it right means more lives lost and ruined. The government needs to tackle prices and address the inequality of extra costs that disabled people face, work towards the redistribution of wealth 
and establish a welfare system that provides an adequate level of support for disabled people. Mr Deputy Speaker, we need radical transformational change. Thank you. And the wind-ups will begin immediately after Mr. Henry sits down. <laughs> no, Drew Henry. <laughs> I thought you would give me an instruction to sit down there, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you for allowing me to speak in what is a cost of living debate. Now, the Shadow Secretary of State and I share a, an allegiance to our football team, and when we go to the, some, some of the stadiums, particularly the big Shame. events, Shame. we can often look across and see the empty seats across and go. Did the opposition come dressed as seats? And I look here behind him and wonder if the rest of his party have done the same. But no, no, they haven't bothered to turn up because, as the Honourable Member for Leicester East has just pointed out, this is an issue about whether or not people can afford to heat their homes or eat. In fact, it's worse than that because in Scotland, during the winter, we had people who couldn't afford to heat or eat in their homes. And this is an important thing that we should have seen the Labour Party turn out for, but of course we didn't. And when it comes to Brexit, well, the harms, we've heard quite a lot of the harms today in this chamber, Mr Deputy Speaker, and my colleagues have covered a number of them, from the economy, from trade, to the impact on our population, to education, to rights and devolution, the cost of living and the cost of food. And as my honourable friend for Edinburgh North and Leith pointed out, when food price inflation goes up, it disproportionately hurts the least advantaged in our society and the poorest that are there. But it's worse than that, because food price infl inflation on basic foods is actually higher than the headline rate. It goes up even more. These are the basic staples that people rely on. And yet the Labour Party couldn't even bother to turn up to discuss that here today with us in this debate. Now, the Brexit, uh, the, the Brexit that's been forced upon us is the gift that Scotland didn't want and keeps on giving misery. It keeps on delivering misery across uh, Scotland for yeah, people. Yeah. I've just mentioned some of the things that affect it. And, of course, Labour now support Brexit. And if that, as we heard from the, leader, la the, the, the Labour leader, if that sounds conservative, they just don't care about that. It's made sure that GDP is 4% lower across the UK. £870 per year increased on average in a cost of living. And by the end of last year, Brexit had already cost nearly £6 billion across the UK in higher food bills, according to the London School of Economics. £100 billion in lost economic input. And the, when it comes to business, the British Chamber of Commerce have said more than half of their members have faced difficulties because of Brexit. And they, they quote one of their members saying that leaving the EU has made us uncompetitive as a fairly standard comment that they get to them. The cost in human capital, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, has been tremendous for us. We have six to nine per cent of care home staff in Scotland used to be EU nationals before Brexit. And now we see that we're struggling to find those spaces for people in care homes because we can't get the staff. And the UK government are doing nothing, nothing about getting that sorted out. They're doing nothing to solve the misery for people that need that kind of support. And of course, we, we have an unemployment rate, a record low in Scotland at 3%. So where are we supposed to get the people that the Brexit yeah, yeah. has starved us of the human capital that we need? And of course, we heard the I word. I thought the Honourable uh, Member from, uh, uh, from Edinburgh um, West was going to talk about Ireland, independent Ireland, <laughs> with a, over the next two years a £27 billion Euro, uh, surplus yeah. uh, for it. So, but no, no, she didn't want to do that. She didn't want to talk about the success stories of those small independent countries with less resources than Scotland that have actually stayed in the European Union and grown as a benefit of it. And when we talk about energy, Mr Deputy Speaker, I just want to reflect on a letter, or an issue I'd raised, I should say, with the Secretary of State for Energy, about the higher energy tariffs that we face in the highlands and islands of Scotland. I got uh, an answer back because, you know, I said we need to do something about this. I went, offered to work with them to see what we could do about this, but no. The answer I got back, and I quote, is that geographic circumstances uh, are the 
uh, issue. The distances involved results in higher costs to distribute there than other places in Britain. Well, that's rich. As we export, as we export our renewable energy around the UK, it doesn't matter when the advantage is being taken of that where the distances are, does it? It doesn't matter. It only matters when it costs us more in Scotland and they're not willing to do anything about it. That's the similar thing about off-gas grid regulation for people who are struggling in rural communities with the off-gas grid situation because they pay a much higher uh, premium for their energy than anywhere else. They'll probably have to use more electricity at a higher rate than mains gas and, of course, higher costs for liquid uh, petroleum gas and, of course, for heating oil as well, Mr Deputy Speaker. But, of course, the answer I got back was uh, no. Their, they, their, their, their aim is to protect su suppliers before people. That's the response I got from the UK government. It's simply not good enough from this UK government to just wash their hands of the situation where people are struggling, particularly in rural communities, with exorbitant costs to heat their homes during the, the winter. And when it comes to credit balances, I'm grateful for my honourable friend for mentioning the campaign I've got on credit balances. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, is where people are struggling, but electricity companies hold on to their money in credit, sometimes, in the case of one pensioner in my constituency, nearly £2,000 in credit and looking to increase her direct debit, increase her direct debit, even though she had £2,000 with them, supposedly in the bank with them, for safekeeping, for use, for whatever they want to do it. That money should be returned to people, but no, that's not, that, that's not going to be done either. What we get back is customers can ask for that money back. Well, of course, some people are too frightened to look at their bills because of the costs that they get that they're facing just now. Some people don't know. Some people are actually intimidated. Some people are actually told they can't get that money back by their electricity co uh, companies or they can get a portion of it back or whatever. These are the rights of people that should be fulfilled. They should be able to get their money automatically returned, not kept on credit balances for companies so that they can use it for their own ends. That's exacerbating poverty for people. Uh, there. And, and when we talk about, um, and, and I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Edinburgh West for bringing up uh, the, uh, the, the business rates, because as we've heard, with the small business bonus, we have 100,000 businesses in Scotland that pay no rates whatsoever. So when it comes to helping uh, people in Scotland, when it comes to helping small business, where again, when you talk about rural communities, a lot of micro and small businesses across rural communities, that is something that directly assists them. So does the actions that we take on child poverty. And, you know, when you actually look at the facts, child poverty across the UK is 27%. In Wales, it's 34%. In England, 29%. In Northern Ireland, 24%. And in Scotland, 21%. Now, the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, have said amongst the poorest 30 per cent of households, incomes are boosted by around £2,000 per year compared to England and Wales in Scotland. There are transformational policies to help people. The policy of free bus passes, uh, bus travel for young people in every part of Scotland. The expansion of free high-quality childcare to 1140 hours, available for three- and four-year-olds and two-year-olds from low-income households. The Best Start, Start Foods grant, help with cost of buying healthy food for families with young children. Three Best Start grants for pivotal, that could be pivotal in child's lives and for low-income families, £600 for the first child, £300 for the birth of a later child. Yeah, yeah. The Scottish Child Payment the baby box, the free childcare extension, free school meals, free, free bus passes, and uh, much more from the Scottish Government to help out. The Honourable I will give way. Does the Honourable Gentleman agree with me that the problem with 13 years of austerity is austerity may make the Treasury balance sheet look good in the first year, but what it does is starves local economies because people have no money to spend. And therefore, we see boarded up high streets. And in the end, that reduces the tax state to governments. And yeah, therefore, yeah. it simply doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend is exactly right when she says it starves communities. Worse than that, it starves families. It starves children. It starves 
all, the, all of the opportunity that we can have uh, for people because we don't have those advantages that we should have if we had the powers at, at our disposal in order to make the kinds of decisions that we need to make. Now, these, these uh, supports, these, no, I'm going to finish in just a second. These supports that I've uh, laid out just now are the kinds of policies that we make in Scotland to try to help, to try to mitigate. I have talked about the, you know, the, the trying to mitigate the, the bedroom tax, for example, and other things like that. Those are the kinds of things we know I'm going to finish in just a second. These are the kinds of things that we try to do in Scotland to help to mitigate the harms from this place. We could do so much more. We could do things very, very differently to this place. But we need the powers of independence in order to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, we're moving on to the wind-ups and the I mean, anticipating divisions in 20 minutes' time. David Linden. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish National Party today. I want to start by thanking my honourable friend, the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire South, who opened the debate and laid bare yeah, the yeah. sheer scale of the cost of living crisis for people all across these islands. Um, it's been remarked on uh, over the course of the debate that uh, there have been a number of contributions, uh, mainly, it's got to be said, from the SNP benches. Uh, however, um, I, I do want to, to single out the, the one uh, Conservative Party contribution from the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Murray. He, he started off um, expressing uh, almost a degree of frustration that the motion before the House uh, today uh, touched on the big issues and then spent the rest of his speech complaining about other issues that he wished he could debate, most of which were under the competence of the Scottish Parliament, which, of course, he is a member of. Um, but it was nonetheless very good of him to, to grace himself with his presence. Um, we did have a, a contribution from my honourable friend, the member from Midlothian. He spoke eloquently about the challenge to businesses in Midlothian as a result of the cost of living crisis and was followed by my honourable friend, the member for Angus, eh, who very expertly rebutted many of the points eh, from the honourable member from Murray eh, about comparisons with education policy eh, in England. My honourable friend, the member for Edinburgh North and Leith, spoke about eh, food and drink. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath, Beath, um, he spoke about the impact of the Isidina energy costs in Kirkcaldy. My Honourable Friend, the member for Glasgow North, um, was right to open a speech by painting a picture uh, that most of us at first thought he was talking about Brexit. But actually, it was a reminder of all of the scare stories that we were told in the run-up to the referendum in 2014, every single one of which have come to pass while Scotland remains a member of the United Kingdom, and he was right to do so. The Honourable Lady, the member for Edinburgh West, was her you know, usual cheery self, <laughs> a, a ray of sunshine every single day. What was noticeable, Mr Deputy Speaker, was that the party, the party of the people's vote, she almost avoided mentioning any mention of Brexit. They've gone from being the party of people's vote oh, no. to the party of don't mention Brexit, which she's oh, about no. to do now. <laughs> I, I would respectfully point out that perhaps the honourable member wasn't in the chamber or didn't hear when I talked about Brexit, because my party is more than happy to point out the damage that it's doing to the economy, as I did when I spoke. So perhaps you would like to go back and check the record. I, I was in the chamber. I may have lapsed into a coma, but I think one of the points was that the honourable lady she talks an awful lot about Brexit and the damage of Brexit. The reality is, her party was advocating a people's vote knowing the fact that Brexit was a disaster. So I would ask her if she would just reflect on the hypocrisy of yeah, Liberal yeah. Democrats yeah, on this yeah. idea <coughs> that when the facts change, people should have the opportunity to change their minds. Yeah. It's yeah. sauce for the goose, it's sauce for the gander. Happy to give away, honourable friend. I think I'm right in saying that not only did the Liberal Democrats um, propose a people's vote, they proposed that if they formed the government of the United Kingdom after the last general election, they would have reversed Brexit immediately. So they actually say that you can have a de facto referendum in the shape of a general election, because that was their policy, to undo Brexit uh, if they won the UK general election. Now, of course, we're happy to continue with Brexit. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, I would just caution my honourable friend, the member for Glasgow North, not to take absolutely seriously any of the commitments made by the Liberal Democrats that are up <laughs> to a general election. Um, I know that the Labour Party have been taking a leaf out of the book of Nick Clegg when it comes to the, the issue of tuition fees in the run-up to a general election, but perhaps yeah. the honourable lady will have that in our next leaflet. Um, the hon my honourable friend, the member for Arfon, spoke about energy, and indeed my honourable friend, the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North, uh, spoke passionately about businesses in his constituency and the very impact that Brexit is having upon them. 
I was, my, my little heart was, was cheered away when the Honourable Lady, the member for Leicester East, got to her feet uh, to take part in the debate. Uh, it was only about five minutes into the speech that I realised that she is not a member of the Labour Party anymore, so therefore we could not tick them off uh, our speech. And then we were finished off by my honourable friend, the member for Inverness, Nairn, Baedlock and Straths Bay, who spoke about a number of issues, namely fuel poverty in the Highlands, which has been a massive issue. Probably not. There was a common theme this <laughs> afternoon, especially from colleagues on the SNP benches, and I know it's borne out from what we are all, Mr Deputy Speaker, hearing on the doorsteps. And in short, that theme, which came up time and again, is that Scotland can no longer afford to be tied to an intransigent British government, which is ploughing on with Brexit at any cost. And it is clearer than ever that we need independence so that people in Scotland can stop paying the price for disastrous decisions made here in London by a government that Scotland did not vote for. Indeed, we have not voted for the Tories since 1955. But we should be clear that the cost of living crisis is not necessarily a new thing. Yes, it's got worse. But for many of those, those that I represent in Glasgow's East End, the cost of living crisis has been a permanent fixture in their lives due to Westminster's inability to truly tackle structural inequality. And in short, the cost of living crisis is the culmination of 13 long, brutal, cold years of austerity policies compounded by Brexit and last year's kamikaze budget, which crashed their economy and trashed the Tories' record on economic credibility. But let us just look at the backdrop against which uh, today's debate takes place. Because in this, the sixth richest economy in the world, baby formula is now security tagged. It's now put behind tills to avert mothers stealing milk to feed their children. Now, if that is the image that ministers wish to project when it comes to Global Britain, then it's certainly a look. I'll give them that. But I think it would be remiss of me when we focus on supermarkets and retailers and how we discuss the cost of living crisis to look at what's before the motion today. And I would ask members to think very carefully about what is in the motion, because it deals with the issue of price gouging, none of which was referenced by the front benches and the need for tougher action in what has been dubbed greedflation. Yeah, yeah. Now, we believe that ministers should follow the lead of other European countries to bring down the price of food and other necessities, a view which is supported by many of my constituents who are absolutely baffled whilst Westminster stands idly by whilst food prices continue to skyrocket. For example, France introduced a price block on staple products, with supermarkets pledging to keep the prices of certain food and hygiene products as low as possible. And it's precisely, Mr Deputy Speaker, for that reason that the British Government must intervene and put pressure on major retailers to pass on falling wholesale prices to consumers. But more than that, it's vital that the Competition and Markets Authority utilise the full powers that they have here, here. and impose maximum fines where evidence of price gouging is found. Because profiteering from selling basic necessities is unjust at any time. But at a time when numbers and in that record numbers of people are turning to food banks and skipping meals is simply abhorrent. Now, the Bank of England recently found that falling costs at some companies were not automatically being passed through to consumer prices in an attempt to rebuild profit margins. Indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was just revealed on Friday that the Chief Executive of Tesco received a £4.4 million pay packet last year. Ken Murphy was given a base salary of £1.37 million and received £2.73 million in an annual bonus, making around 197 times the amount of the average Tesco worker. That is the level of inequality that we have baked into a system which is broken and broken beyond repair. And I can tell you that when I go to Tesco in Shettleston, the, the very many people that I bump into there are, are shocked at the idea that you have a boss coining in £4.4 million when many of them are trying to work out what they can remove from their basket so they look at enough to get by. Of course, stubbornly high inflation extends so much more than food. Each week on the doorsteps, constituents tell me of how they have resorted to rationing baths and showers simply to save on energy costs. And that my constituents live in an energy-rich nation but experience eye-watering levels of fuel poverty 
is a damning indictment of just how ridiculous the situation has become and why change is desperately needed. But we know that all of this is exacerbated by Brexit, a Brexit which Scotland rejected, yet has had foisted upon us against our will. Indeed, it is the only nation in these islands to have been so royally screwed over as a result of the 2016 referendum. But we all know from bitter experience that the slogans on the side of buses were nothing more than empty rhetoric. In 2016, the Right Honourable Member for North East Somerset slammed the Resolution Foundation's findings that food prices would increase as a result of Brexit as ridiculous, claiming that the price of food will go down after Brexit. What's more, last year he suggested that the rules that the British government follows whilst being part of the EU made an, I quote, life harder for small businesses and increased the costs of operating. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, is an entirely false claim. The hard Brexit that ministers pursued has made life harder for food exporting and importing businesses. And don't just take my word for it. Nick Allen, Chief Executive of the British Meat Processors Association, told The Independent that the extra burden of new paperwork and fees will see some small specialist importers struggling to survive. And we know the price of Brexit, and it is one that Scotland cannot afford to pay. Now, the OPR predicted in March that the UK's GDP will fall 4% as a result of Brexit, with trade and exports reducing some 15%. And recently released figures by the ONS show that the UK economy contracted 0.3% in March, making the UK the worst performing economy out of the G7 the only G7 economy to experience negative economic growth. And on Thursday last week, the, the Bank of England rose interest rates to 4.5%, the 12th consecutive interest rate rise. And for many of our constituents coming off of a, a fixed rate, they are literally watching hundreds of pounds being added to their mortgage bill as a Tory premium, simply for the pleasure of having an incompetent Westminster government that Scotland did not vote for. Yeah, yeah. Now, the Conservative Party inflicting economic pain is hardly a surprise to my constituents. It's probably why we've not had a Conservative MP in the East End for over 110 yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> but what of the, the Labour Party off to my right? And I, I mean that in more respects than one. Because in this Labour Party, we have nothing more than a pound shop Tory Blair Tribute Act, which is devoid of ideas <laughs> and lurching ever further to the right in a desperate scramble for the votes of Tory English market towns. And on the biggest issues of the day, which have caused economic harm to these islands, the Labour Party has, I'm afraid, nothing to say. On immigration policy, more of the same. On Brexit, more of the same. On social security, more of the same. And so I therefore say to our colleague from Edinburgh South on the Labour benches, simply hoping that the Tories just run out of steam and that the keys to number 10 Downing Street land into the laps of Starmer and Streeting is no vision to enthuse electors. Because in my constituency, voters are clear. They want Brexit binned. They want their MPs showing solidarity with public sector workers striking yeah, for fair yeah, pay. Yeah. They want a social security system that provides a safety net. And yes, unashamedly, they want an immigration system that is not driven by focus groups and dog whistle politics, but is responsive to the needs of our small island nation and its economic needs. Yeah, yeah. These, Mr Deputy Speaker, are the challenges that Scotland faces today. But by failing to support today's motion on the biggest issue of the day, Labour and the Tories are simply showing Scotland that it stands at a fork in the road, and the choice could not be clearer. Scotland can veer off to the right with the full fat Tories or the diet Tories and pursue yet more economic self-harm with Brexit and austerity. Or it can veer left by voting yes to independence, rejoining the European Union and unhooking itself from the binfire, the economic binfire that is the United Kingdom. And it's on that basis that I commend the motion to the House. Yeah. Um, well, we had um, agreed 10 minutes wind-ups, and there seems to have been 40% inflation on that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wasn't going to stop, stop you, because it is your debate, but I have to give equal time. So, Minister. Thank you, Madam. Mr Deputy Speaker, I should say. <clears throat> You've changed so much during the day. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I think as parliamentarians we must first and foremost be Democrats. And in respect of the decision of the uh, British people on the EU referendum, we must be accepting of that democratic decision. I believe also in respect of the decision of the Scottish people in respect of the Scottish referendum that we must accept that decision. I wish that the party opposite did accept that decision. I was proud, as the Member of Parliament for Hexham, which goes to Carter Bar on the border, to campaign from Aberdeen to Allen, from the borders to Edinburgh, to make the case for the Union, and I believe we should continue to do so in this place. Yeah. It is unquestionably the case, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this Government fully appreciates and is assessing and assisting the pressures that households face across the United Kingdom. It is quite clear this is derived by reason of the challenges of high inflation, the impacts of COVID and the impacts of global issues, most particularly the Putin invasion in Ukraine. That is why we continue to take extensive action to help households. In 2023-24, we have increased benefit rates in state pensions by 10.1 per cent and will spend around £276 billion through welfare support in Great Britain. We have never spent more in this country on low-income families, the disabled or pensioners. In respect to the cost of living, the steps we have taken over the last year show that this is a government that will always protect those who are most vulnerable. The total support package we have provided uh, to help with the rising bills is worth over £94 billion across 2023 and 2023-24. That's over £3,300 per UK household on average. Included in this are the cost of living payments made to over 8 million low-income households, around 6 million disabled people and over 8 million pensioner households last year, and pension credit has had a massive increase in applications of 170 per cent. The Government paid out £37 billion in the summer of 2022, billions in autumn 2022, and the DWP has recently made cost of living payments worth £2.2 billion so far this year. This year, over 8 million households will get additional payments of up to £900. Over 99 per cent of eligible households on a DWP means-tested benefit have now received their first cost of living payment during 2023-24 of £301. And we see that over 6 million people across the UK on eligible disability benefits will receive a further £150 disability cost of living payment this summer to help with additional costs. And more than 8 million households of pensioners across the UK will receive an additional £300 cost of living payment this winter. And we also have included uh, on the ongoing support the cost of living support of the energy price guarantee, which continues to the summer. Clearly, we believe very strongly that work is the best way out of poverty, that the, we have the opportunity through our job centres up and down the country to assist people and to provide support for them all across the country, whether that is young people through youth hubs, whether that is the 50-plus offer, whether that is the in-work progression, whether it is the massive increase in disability employment. We are progressing those and supporting those people uh, who are in work uh, to get better jobs and a better opportunity for the way ahead. That's why we're extending the support our job centres offer to low-paid workers so that they can increase their hours and move into better-paid, higher-quality jobs. For those on a universal credit, we are increasing the childcare maximum cap to £951 for one child and £1,630 for two or more children. We are paying childcare costs up front when parents move into paid work or increase their hours. And we are further supporting working people with the largest ever increase to the national living wage. That's an increase of 9.7% uh, to £10.42 an hour from this April. This represents an increase of over £1,600 to the annual earnings of a full-time worker. There, there was much criticism, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, of, of the UK economy, but we have to bear in mind that the UK has the fourth highest employment rate in the G7. That is higher than the US, it's higher than France, it's higher than Italy. We have unemployment rate that remains low at 3.9%. We have more people on the payroll employment than before the pandemic at 30 million. There's a substantial package, part of which I've outlined, of labour market interventions announced at the spring budget, which are a huge boost to our efforts. We see youth unemployment, so youth as 
as the honourable gentleman's colleague said, probably not. Um, we have youth employment, which is second best in the G7. Uh, we have economic inactivity back at 2018 levels, and we have vacancies that have dropped 10 quarters in a row. The reality of the situation is that we heard much from the SNP uh, during the debate. No talk whatsoever of uh, luxury camper vans worth £100,000. No talk of missing auditors. No talk of ferries to the Western Isles that don't exist. Presumably those ferries have both the auditors and the camper vans on them. No talk of uh, the child commissioner's uh, comments that the SNP Scottish Government had failed its people. No talk of the 16 years of failure on police, on education, on health. No talk of their abandonment, total abandonment of the oil and gas sector. Yeah. And we're having a discussion, Mr Deputy Speaker, a discussion on the cost of living. And they would rather import uh, oil and gas from overseas than actually support the 100,000 jobs in the northeast of Scotland, yeah. and to support the businesses that we have. And the truth is, they are in partnership with the Greens, who are closely related to Extinction Rebellion, who are clearly and have explicitly stated that they are anti-economic growth. Why would we import when we can address cost of living with something that is homegrown and support over 100,000 jobs in the northeast of Scotland? That is what this government is doing. That is what my honourable friend from Murray is doing, and we should support him wholeheartedly in this process. We have just passed the uh, Shakespeare's anniversary of 400 years of publication of the uh, uh, Macbeth, a tale, interestingly, Mr Deputy Speaker, of a husband and wife in Scotland whose misdemeanours finally catch up with them. I, I, I'm absolutely sure there is no reference to the present day whatsoever. I'm absolutely sure that the discussion of independence is always tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. That they're absolutely sure that there is nobody here who is full of sound and fury signifying nothing. But I am absolutely certain that this government is assisting on an ongoing basis, and I strongly commend the Prime Minister's motion to the House. Yeah.